we talk about even the private issues of money in 2023, isn't that still a bit anachronistic in the sense that most money just generally is a simple database entry. So when we use the bank money, we essentially use private money right now that is redeemable back for legal tender or what we call legal tenders of abstract things. Yeah, absolutely. So most of the money held by the public, most of it is private money. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am joined by Lawrence White, a professor of economics at George Mason University and one of my favorite economists because he writes about the topics that I think about a lot. Dr. White's most recent book is titled Better Money, Gold, Fiat or Bitcoin. Let's jump right into the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure. I've been following your work for actually, several years now. I've read most of your books, if not all of them. So this book is a good introduction for people who are usually your most recent book, Better Money. It's a good introduction to some of the core contentious problems that come up these days, especially when it comes to things about monetary standards. So I want to dive right into a real world scenario of El Salvador. So you have El Salvador being the first country to legally make Bitcoin legal tender in that country. From the onset, when you first heard that, did you think it was a good idea or do you think it was just a good marketing ploy? I remember the discussions on Twitter about the legislation before it was passed, and there was understandably a lot of concern about the sections that made it mandatory for businesses to accept Bitcoin, whether they wanted to or not, which it turned out are not really being enforced. But making Bitcoin a legal tender in the sense of making it legal to transact in Bitcoin and making contracts written in Bitcoin enforceable, sure, that's a good idea. and. That should be true of all currencies that people want to make contracts in. Some would say that, okay, you shouldn't really need a specific legal tender law for this specific currency, given as far as I'm aware, it wasn't initially not legal to make it to do contracts in Bitcoin, even in El Salvador, I believe. But it felt like the current president, Bukele, wanted some kind of, let's say, avenue to get beyond the U.S. dollar that's constantly being used in the country given dollarized. Is that some idea you think is true? There is a problem getting a critical mass of any alternative currency to be used as a medium of exchange. That is, I don't want to be paid in Bitcoin if I can't turn around and spend them on the things I want to buy every day. And so he was trying to jumpstart it as an alternative medium of exchange, and they even distributed wallets with so many Bitcoin in them to anybody who signed up for it. And as I understand it, most people immediately cashed out the Bitcoin for dollars and the uh, ATMs were overloaded with requests. So it hasn't actually succeeded in getting Bitcoin into use as a commonly accepted medium of exchange, except as I understand, in, there's one beach community in El Salvador where it's commonly used. So that brings up the point I've always been a bit concerned about, but we can use Ecuador as a kind of other example of this. There's some Latin American countries that are dollarized and Caribbean countries too, but because of the fiscal constraints that dollarization usually imposes on countries, they try to get past it in some way. So in Ecuador, Latin America is quite this like, hidden gem of monetary innovation in some ways. Ecuador, I believe, did try to do a CBDC before CBDCs were cool. And that was also in some attempt to give the government more flexibility when it comes to fiscal or monetary spending, monetary financing in some way. What's your take on that the idea that the dollarization of a country is a bit too constraining for potential fiscal management? I think it's a virtue of dollarization that it's constraining when you realize that governments that are trying to get around it in Ecuador were trying to outspend more than they were taking in and they were trying to print money to pay the difference, which is, of course, how Ecuador got into a very high inflation before they dollarized. As you said, I've written about this on the Alt-M blog, President Correa tried to introduce an electronic currency in the form of a cell phone currency denominated in dollars issued by the central bank that would be transferable through cell phone accounts. 
with the government's cell phone service. And the public wasn't that interested. Despite a lot of money spent on marketing, people didn't want to sign up for it. Because if you do, then you're trusting the government not to default on its dollar obligations, that they're actually going to pay the dollars that you have in your account when you go to spend them or redeem them. But the Ecuadorian government under Correa had defaulted on its dollar-denominated bonds, so they weren't really very trustworthy as an issuer of dollar-denominated liabilities. But that was the constraint that Correa was struggling against. And some of my former students have written about how in Ecuador was a blessing to the taxpayers of Ecuador because it constrained government spending to stay within their means. Some of the more ambitious programs that Correa had, he couldn't implement because he couldn't raise the tax revenue and he couldn't print the money. So that is a virtue of dollarization in the face of a fiscally irresponsible government. I remember you wrote about how initially dollarization in Ecuador was more of a bottom-up process. I think that's not usually how it's phrased in normal discussion of dollarization in Ecuador. Yeah, so there's dollarization from the bottom up where whether it's legal or not, people start keeping their savings in dollars because the local currency is so unstable and so inflationary. So in Ecuador, I believe it was more than 90% of the transactions the bank accounts were in dollars. You see a similar thing in Argentina today. Unofficially, it's 90% dollarized uh, just because people want to choose a better money. And then what Ecuador finally had to do, what the Ecuadorian government finally realized was that by trying to retain their own currency, they were actually harming themselves because the tax revenue they collected in Sucre's wasn't worth much by the time they collected it since inflation was over 100%. And so they converted the last people to use Sucre's were government employees who were paid in it. Ordinary people would, if they were paid in Sucre's, would immediately convert them to dollars. And so the government finally tossed in the towel, said, okay, nobody wants our currency. Even we don't want to be paid in it. It's losing value so rapidly. So let's make taxes payable in dollars and let's pay public sector employees in dollars. And they wound down the Sucre by converting all the remaining sucres, which weren't worth much in the aggregate, into dollars at an artificially chosen exchange rate of 25000 to the dollar. I don't see that much written about Panama when it comes to dollar zone type experiments and management. Am I just missing something? Panama has been on the U.S. dollar since 1904, and there's been no crisis, so there's really not much to write about. It's been a very stable system. It's one of the few countries in Latin America where you can get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage because it's all in dollars. And because the banks have both assets and liabilities in dollars, they're not taking a risk. There's no currency exposure, no exchange devaluation risk. And so it's a very stable system. Panama is like the 13th Federal Reserve District, except they don't send a vote. They don't have a vote on the FOMC. So there's not much on a year-to-year -year basis to talk about. It's a very successful system. Yeah, so I used to live in Panama, and one of the things that I always found curious, so a lot of banks from other Latin American countries would have a branch in Panama for the sole reason of issuing loans back in the home country in dollars. Almost like a point of stability even for other countries that don't have dollar to still use Panama as a point to issue loans. So those banks must have also had a lot of dollar deposits. You can understand why if the local currency is losing value rapidly. Exactly. Argentina, of course, now is potentially dollarizing. It seems it's actually not as clear cut as it was on the campaign trail. But one of the biggest objections that people, at least I see on Twitter, <laughs> some people on dollarization in Argentina is that there's not enough dollars available to dollarize. That's the typical version of the objection. How credible is that objection? As I said, the Argentine public is about 90% dollarized. There is a huge number of Federal Reserve notes circulating in uh, Argentina. Not entirely legally. Businesses aren't allowed to accept them, although some do. And so the public is ready to make dollar deposits into banks when dollar bank accounts become legal and 
protected. They had an earlier episode, of course, in the 1990s where they legalized dollar deposits, but that episode ended with the government confiscating all those deposits, forcing conversion into pesos at a terrible exchange rate and completely ripping off the people who had dollar deposits. So hopefully the Malay believes more in property rights than the previous government did. But a lot of Argentines keep their savings in dollars offshore, in particular in Uruguay. There's a lot of dollar-denominated banking. And then, of course, in the black market, everybody knows where to convert pesos to dollars. So I was in Argentina a few weeks ago for a conference, a Bitcoin conference, but everybody could tell me, if you want to convert your dollars to pesos, which will enable you to get a much better exchange rate than the official exchange rate, here's the flower shop you go to. And isn't it hidden? Isn't it and not really? It's pretty much out in the open. And in fact, they hire off-duty policemen to provide security for all the cash that's changing hands. So it seemed to be tolerated in the black market in which dollars are changed for pesos. So there's a lot of dollars there. Now, the real problem with dollarization in Argentina is that the central bank is insolvent. When a central bank is solvent, it's easy to dollarize. You just sell their assets, convert the proceeds into dollars, and now you've got a central bank with dollar-denominated assets, and they can use those to buy back the pesos in circulation. If they have assets equal to their liabilities, they buy back all the pesos. No problem. The Argentine central bank doesn't have enough assets to buy back all the pesos at the current exchange rate against dollars. So part of the plan for dollarization that Millet endorsed that was written by Emilio Ocampo and Nicholas Kachinowski had a plan to deal with that by basically refinancing the assets of the central bank so that the insolvency could be resolved gradually or the debts could be paid off over time as the government starts to get tax revenue in dollars. If it runs a surplus, then it can pay off its old debts. And so that was the plan. And part of that, of course, is running a surplus. So Malay was promising to cut spending by 15%, which would have been enough to do that. But Ocampo ended up he was the designated person to be the last head of the central bank. He was going to come in and convert to dollars and shut down the central bank because there's no reason to have a central bank if there's no local currency. But he eventually turned down the job after the election because apparently he wasn't going to be able to implement the plan that he had proposed and that he wanted to implement. And so it remains to be seen who's going to be appointed to do that job and how eager they're going to be. And so the Malay people keep saying that we still plan to shut down the central bank and dollarize. But as you said, it's a little bit up in the air as to how and when that will happen. So I have a few questions on the gold standard, but for context, could you explain exactly what you mean by gold standard, especially in the most recent book, so you have like an even playing field? So in a way, dollarizing for a country like Argentina is like in the 19th century, a country deciding to go on the gold standard. That is, they're adopting an external money that is a world currency, and that constrains the creation of currency in the home country because they have to back it up. They can't issue more money than they're prepared to redeem. And so under a gold standard, they need gold reserves. Under a dollar standard, they need dollar reserves. That is assuming you have a central bank. If you don't have a central bank and under a gold standard, you don't need a central bank, you can have currency issued by commercial banks and then they need the reserves. Anyway, by a gold standard, a system in which gold serves as the most basic money of redemption. And the monetary unit is defined as so many grams of gold. So when the U.S. was on a gold standard, it's usually not expressed as how many ounces of gold were in a dollar, but the other way around. It was $20.67 was equivalent to one ounce of gold. Or later, under Roosevelt, after the devaluation, it was $35 per ounce of gold. But that was a rate at which dollar-denominated currency could be redeemed. When it was private redemption, banks had coins in their vault. When currency issue was monopolized by the government, it was the U.S. Treasury that had gold in its vault to redeem dollars at $35 an ounce. Now, after the Second World War, it was a kind of quasi-gold standard under the so-called Bretton Woods system, where only the U.S. dollar was redeemable for gold. Other currencies were redeemable for dollars. And the dollar was redeemable for gold only for foreign central banks. U.S. citizens were barred by law from owning gold coins. So it wasn't a full-fledged gold standard. An ordinary or full-fledged gold standard is one in which anybody can 
hold gold coins if they want to. But commonly in the 19th century, people didn't transact in gold coins because it's not convenient to carry around bags of coins for most purposes. They transacted in banknotes and bank deposits, checking accounts. On the face of it, it doesn't look much different from our current system. It's just that behind the scenes, bank liabilities are backed by gold instead of by fiat money. What is the concrete advantage of that particular legal definition of gold standard? In the sense that, for example, in Barbados, where I'm from, from the creation of the central bank in 1973 until two years ago, the official legal definition of Barbados dollar was in grams of gold. They changed it, I think, two years ago, where the official legal definition is one Barbados dollar is 0.5 US dollars. That's not the official one. But even when the definition was gold, determined, it still had extreme monetary financing going on. You couldn't actually go to the central bank and get gold. No, of course not. No. So it was completely fictional. So I'm wondering what then, even if a country were to give the definition of the gold standard into law of the country, the government still has the ability to disregard it in many ways. If the government is the only issuer of currency, that's right, they do. And that's how we got from the gold standard to fiat money, that is irredeemable government-issued money. Governments first monopolized the issue of currency and centralized all the reserves of the system. They had all the gold in the government's central bank. And then when they decided to go off the gold standard, as in the U.S., the obligation to redeem for dollars at $35 an ounce was abrogated in 1971 by President President Nixon, when they say, we're not going to redeem anymore, there's nowhere else to go. And so the dollar becomes an irredeemable fiat money instead of a redeemable money on a gold standard. For that reason, it's more robust of a system if you decentralize the issue of gold redeemable money in what historically was called a free banking system, where any commercial bank can not only issue deposits, that is to create checking accounts, but they can also issue paper currency that says, we'll pay the bearer on demand so many gold coins. There's still private currency issue in a few places in the world, so it's not completely a relic of the past. So in Scotland, three banks still issue their own notes. They're redeemable for Bank of England currency or for pound coins. Northern Ireland, same thing. And Hong Kong and Macau still have private note issue. So it's not that big a deal. And people... There are different brands of notes. People treat them as interchangeable, just the way today a check written on Citibank is interchangeable with a check written on Wells Fargo. They're both accepted at full face value. But when we talk about even the private issues of money in 2023, isn't that still a bit anachronistic in the sense that most money just generally is a simple database entry? So when we use the bank money, we essentially use private money right now that is redeemable back for legal tender or what we call legal tender some abstract things. Yeah, absolutely. So most of the money held by the public, if we measure it by M2, which is all bank deposits plus Federal Reserve notes in circulation, most of it is private money. It's liabilities of private commercial banks. And it's redeemable in the base money, which is Federal Reserve notes or deposit balances on the books of the Federal Reserve System. For small countries, like every Caribbean country, most Latin American countries, they really don't have a good reason to have their own currency, no matter what actual standards it's on. But then, would it make us any difference if they were to adopt a specific kind of currency standard, gold standard, Bitcoin standard, or a dollar standard? Or would it just matter in particular if the U.S. has a different standard base? The idea of better money is a proper standardization of currency. Is it relevant for small countries? Yes, there's a sense in which you're right. There's no good reason for them to have their own money, but there is a motive. And the motive is they make a little bit of profit. They get a little bit of seniorage by issuing their own currency. So presumably in Barbados, to keep the exchange rate at U.S. dollar, the central bank has to have U.S. dollar assets, which it's prepared to sell in order to buy back Barbadian dollars if people want to switch. So they can earn interest on those assets. They don't have to hold them all in cash. Whereas if you had outright dollarization where Federal Reserve notes circulated in Barbados, then there's no interest-free loan to the government by from having currency in circulation. Now, there is a way to have a dollar standard 
and still have some local seniorage or float, interest-free loan from issuing currency, and that is to let private commercial banks issue currency again, like they do in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Hong Kong. And I've proposed that in Panama, hasn't been taken up yet. (laughs) So if you're living in Barbados, what difference does it make? As long as the central bank maintains the fixed exchange rate and maintains enough reserves to keep it fixed, doesn't pursue a monetary policy inconsistent with keeping the exchange rate fixed, that is, doesn't try to issue more money than is consistent with that, then it doesn't make a lot of difference to the average citizen, except it's a little less secure. There is a little bit of risk that there will be a devaluation. And this is the reason, for example, that El Salvador decided to dollarize. They had been pegged to the dollar for a long time, and they had the same inflation rate as the dollar. So they had a system pretty much like in Barbados, but they discovered that when they went to borrow money in their own currency, they had to pay high interest rates because lenders were worried about devaluation. They still had the option to devalue against the dollar, even if they promised that they wouldn't. So by dollarizing, the interest rate at which the government could borrow came down quite a bit. That was the main motive for it there because there wasn't any inflation crisis like in Ecuador because they were maintaining the peg to the dollar, which means they had the dollar inflation rate. So likewise in Barbados, as long as you trust the central bank, it doesn't make a lot of difference, but there probably is some small devaluation risk in borrowing and that could be eliminated by outright dollarization. I think there's actually a substantial devaluation risk almost every year. So other Caribbean countries have gone through a devaluation problem. Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica, they were all pegged to USD back in the 70s, but they had deep pegs and it got worse every, almost every year since then, at uh, least in Latin America. And then in Barbados, one of the reasons they can maintain the peg is because of exchange controls. They have capital controls. I haven't been to Barbados, but I've been to the Bahamas. And it's a similar system there where the Bahamas dollar is pegged to the U.S. dollar. And so what's the point in having a central bank? The central bank does occasionally engage in more monetary expansion to, I don't know, finance the budget or something to the point where it's inconsistent with the pegged exchange rate. So then they impose exchange controls until they can reel in the excess to the point where they can maintain the exchange rate without exchange controls. But then everybody in the Bahamas knows that if you want safe savings, you need a bank account in Florida. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So beyond small countries now, from small countries, I guess in my view, then the best you can do is dollarize because you have the system where government might say they want to maintain the exchange rate, but if something happens and they don't. And in Caribbean, there's more reason to not than to actually maintain the exchange rate. So if you leave it to the choice of the public, this is the most important criterion for whether you have the right money. If you leave it to the choice of the public, eliminate exchange controls, fully legalize banking in whatever currency people want to use and honor the property rights created by that, then I suspect that people would put themselves on the U.S. dollar. And then it's just a matter of the government bowing to the public's preferences. So I'm not saying the government should come in and impose dollars on people who don't want dollars, but it should let people who do want dollars put themselves on the dollar. In most small countries that are peripheral to the United States, they would do that. So I want to go towards Bitcoin now because the idea of a Bitcoin standard is hard to grasp in many ways. Obviously, it's similar in some ways to a gold standard, but you can explain the actual supply constraints are different. Why are we even considering the idea of a Bitcoin standard for actual national money? If you read the white paper that the so-called Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym for the creator of Bitcoin, issued, and other things he, she, or they wrote at the time before disappearing. The vision that Satoshi had for Bitcoin was that it was going to become a world currency. And why would that be desirable? Two reasons. One, because we rely on central banks not to inflate the currency and they keep betraying our reliance. They keep betraying our trust. And secondly, we want a payment system that's private, that is not censored by governments, that is protected. And the design of Bitcoin is to provide a payment system that is outside of central banks, and that it has succeeded in doing. So if you want to send money to, say, a dissident group in Belarus, 
you can't send them dollars. The government won't let them have a bank account in dollars. They'll stop the wire transfer. So payments are censored through the ordinary network by central banks. If not by the U.S. central bank, then by the Belarusian central bank. But you can send them Bitcoin. So it has its own payment rails that are hard, if not impossible, to censor. So that part's been a success. And the system has proven very robust. That is, the payment system's never gone down. But the part about becoming a world currency, that hasn't gone so well. And as I argue in the book, it's because the design of Bitcoin is one in which the supply is absolutely rigid. That is, the program tells us how many Bitcoin we have today, how many we'll have tomorrow. There's a programmed release schedule. It's insensitive to the price of Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin demand goes up, the price goes up by the full amount. When demand goes down, the price goes down by the full amount. There's no variation in the quantity the way that there is in ordinary commodities or the way there is in gold to moderate the movements in the price. Or if you think about it relative, not the price in dollars, but the price in terms of goods and services, that the purchasing power of Bitcoin, the purchasing power of Bitcoin is quite volatile, much more volatile than the purchasing power of gold. That's a problem. And this volatility has attracted people to Bitcoin who want to speculate in it. And of course, those who got in early have done very well. And right now they're doing well. It, it's back up above $40,000. But it has been up and down the last few years. There's no guarantee that if you hold Bitcoin long enough starting now that you will make a profit. But by becoming a speculative vehicle, it's made it difficult for Bitcoin to attract people who just want a bank account. As long as your payments are denominated in dollars, your rent payment and your utilities, it would be very foolish to keep that money in the form of Bitcoin because it could drop 10% tomorrow and then you can't make your payments. People are holding Bitcoin as an investment and it's proven increasingly popular in that role, but they're not using it as a medium of exchange. They're not keeping their ordinary cash balances in that form. And there are a couple of other reasons the transaction fees are relatively high for using the blockchain directly. There are second layer payment systems that are cheaper, but it takes a certain amount of sophistication to use them. So it's a little harder for people to get their head around. But it has the problem that I mentioned earlier of attaining a critical mass of users. And there's no reason for it to attract people who want a better medium of exchange as long as its purchasing power is so volatile. There are ways to essentially trade gold online, and you can see it potentially if gold would become a more popular asset, you can see that a lot bigger chunk of trading. But whether then gold could gold also have that same kind of volatility if it is that a way to speculate on the price of gold. People speculate in gold now. There are exchange-traded funds denominated in gold. As you mentioned, there are ways to buy gold online. Two of the biggest gold-denominated stable coins are Tether Gold and Pax Gold. And so you buy and sell them just like you buy and sell any other cryptocurrency. So they're using the blockchain technology that Bitcoin introduced, but they're not that popular relative to Bitcoin. The value they have in circulation is like one thousandth of the amount of Bitcoin in circulation. And they're not all that easy to use as a medium of exchange because there are transaction fees associated with them. It's free to transfer to somebody else. No, I take that back. The Tether Gold and Pax Gold are both Ethereum tokens. So you have to pay Ethereum gas fees if you're going to transfer them to somebody else. And that discourages their use as an everyday medium of exchange. There are some cheaper systems. There's a company called Glint, and there are others that offer a kind of gold-denominated bank accounts online. But the transfers are free only to people who are customers of the same service. So that's a very small number of people, so hard to use as a commonly accepted medium of exchange. Gold has the same problem that Bitcoin has of attracting a critical mass of users as a medium of exchange, even though its volatility is much lower than Bitcoin's. That is, the price volatility of gold is much lower than Bitcoin. It's like a, less than a quarter of the daily movements or monthly movements in the price of gold. So I think it has a better chance of being adopted, but it's still at a disadvantage compared to the established network. There is the problem of attracting a critical mass. Now, you do see people adopt a new currency when you see spontaneous dollarization in high inflation countries. 
And what that suggests to me is that we're not going to see a lot of people putting themselves on the gold standard or the Bitcoin standard unless they face really high inflation in the dollar. Or they live in a country which is like Venezuela, which for a while was very vigilant against people using dollars, but allowed people or was unable to stop them from using gold or Bitcoin. So you actually did see reemergence of a physical gold standard in parts of Venezuela where people are paying in flakes of gold. And there are transactions in Venezuela in Bitcoin as well for ordinary goods and services. So under those extreme conditions, people will put themselves on a gold standard or a Bitcoin standard, but ordinarily they will put themselves on a dollar standard if they're in Latin America. The reason the dollar has attained this role of being the world's most popular money is that it was the basis of the Bretton Woods system after World War II. And it has, until last year, <laughs> maintained a pretty low inflation record. Not quite as good as the yen or the Swiss franc, but it has a much bigger payment network than the yen or the Swiss franc. And so people would put themselves on the dollar rather than those other currencies. It's a role it gained historically, and in these situations where the incumbent has an advantage, the dollar happened to be the incumbent. Unless they do something to mess it up, unless we have high inflation in dollars without the prospect of returning. So if we had 20% inflation in the U.S. dollar and it didn't look like it was ending anytime soon, people would abandon the dollar and they would find something else. One other thing, which is the U.S. government has been using access to the dollar payment network as a tool to punish countries who are not on friendly terms with the U.S. for foreign policy reasons. So sanctions against Iran, sanctions against Russia. Naturally, then Russia and Iran are going to look for some other currency to conduct their transactions in because they're denied access to the banks in New York. That's another way the U.S. could shoot itself in the foot and lose the privilege of being the world's reserve currency. But even in those examples, like Russia, Iran, Russia, for example, is now doing a lot of trade in UAE currency, which itself is pegged to USD. Because so they're only doing that to indirectly get access to USD. But it still feels if the US markets, capital markets, remain like the really only big player in town, could use access any kind of finance you have to do through the US. And they also, most countries don't trust other countries' legal systems to adjudicate contractual disputes of financial assets. But they trust the U.S. courts. They might not trust the U.S. government, but somehow they still trust the U.S. courts per se. So because of that, I wonder what could happen to really displace interest in using USD, even if it had a fairly high inflation. The euro had a shot at displacing the dollar. It was the last great hope of fiat money. <laughs> When it was created, they wrote a constitution for it. And in fact, basically, the Germans wrote the constitution, which said, we don't have a dual mandate. We have a single mandate, which is price stability. And by price stability, we mean inflation under 2%. But the Germans are no longer in control. They're not the median voters at the European Central Bank anymore. And so the euro has not been any more reliable than the US dollar in terms of low inflation. When we had 9% inflation in the middle of last year, they had 10%. And they've been even slower than the U.S. in changing course and bringing inflation down. It's interesting what you mentioned about the role of the U.S. judiciary. And so the U.S. government has created these international banking facilities in Miami and New York, where you can have all the advantages of offshore banking, that is lower taxes and no capital requirements and so on no mandatory deposit insurance. And people put their money there because they trust, as you say, the U.S. bank judicial system over putting their money in, I don't know, the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands. Although in the Cayman Islands, they have a pretty reliable judicial system. In the uh, United Arab Emirates, they've created kind of an offshore banking haven. And in order to give people trust in the judicial system, they've actually hired retired British judges from the UK. So there is this kind of competition for credibility that you mentioned. And yeah, so the US does benefit from the perception that its court system is trustworthy. What do you think about Robert Schiller's idea regarding indexed to money accounts? You mean having an account that's indexed to the consumer price index? Right. 
It's kind of a puzzle to economists generally why we don't seem because it's an obvious way to deal with inflation. In a way, it's an alternative to switching to a different currency. Just index your holdings of whatever currency you're in. And so I'm not sure why we don't see more of it. Now, if you're going to have indexed bank accounts, the bank, in order not to be speculating, has to have indexed assets. You have to get people to agree to take out, let's say, mortgage loans where what they owe is indexed. And so when inflation goes up, their payments go up. In principle, I don't know why people wouldn't agree to that. People agree to floating interest rate loans, which is a kind of second best approximation to that. But if you want price level adjusted deposits, you need price level adjusted loans. And so there is a kind of simultaneity problem. The two things have to grow together. Because I think there's a, at least an implementation of this in Chile. They have a indexed account that they usually use for, I think, large houses and real estate and so on. Yeah, I would need to study that in more detail. But right, they have a fundamental unit, I believe it's called, which is basically uh, linked to the price index. And so the government publishes every month what this index number is. People can write contracts where the obligations are in terms of this index, and the courts will enforce those contracts. In a digital age, nothing we really do for money is primarily physical. And index account could alleviate a lot of the stress or, let's say, contention of even talking about particular sterilization methods. I don't really see it discussed. And if the U.S. were to do it, then essentially it would filter through everywhere else in the world quite quickly. It might even be possible to index physical currency, right? If you have a date stamped on the note, then you can increase the value of the note as the index rises over time. The problem is that it makes the note pretty difficult to use for making change. <laughs> I have a paper actually on this, why don't banknotes pay interest? And I think the answer is there isn't that much interest to collect to where it overcomes just the hassle of looking up what each note is worth every time you transact in it. Because currency changes hands fairly frequently. So if you've got a $10 note that's earning 5% interest, let's see, that's 5% over a year, that's 50 cents. That's less than a penny a week. If you turn the note over in two weeks, is it really worth stopping and calculating what the current value is in order to collect two cents? Probably not. People don't bend over to pick up pennies on the sidewalk anymore. What's your view on the idea of central bank due to currencies for the U.S.? To essentially eliminate all cash and just have the CBDC or a CBDC type centralized object. So cash provides an important role, which is it preserves privacy in transactions. And it's true that some criminals use cash, but lots of honest, everyday people use cash for various reasons that are entirely innocent. People use it to maintain a budget. Some people can't restrain themselves from overspending unless they can look at the stack of cash shrinking as the month goes on. People use cash when they want to, I don't know, buy a gift and they don't want their spouse to see it on their credit card statement. People use cash for, I'll give you an example. I sold a piece, a chair on local Facebook. And somebody comes to buy the chair. It was $500. It's hassle for them to go and get a cashier's check or some other guaranteed form of payment. They paid me in currency and I was happy to accept it because then I can go and deposit it in my bank without any trouble. So it's a way of having a verified payment. I don't want to take an ordinary check because that might bounce. I don't know the person buying it. And people use cash for all kinds of innocent reasons. There are also cash transactions in, of course, gray markets and black markets that involve victimless crimes. So people buying and selling drugs, people transacting for sexual services that are not legal. People who want to stamp out cash kind of turn a blind eye to the fact that those are mutually beneficial transactions from the point of view of the people transacting. They don't have third-party victims. So why should we want to stamp them out? Eliminating cash would make it much more difficult for those kind of transactions to go on. So people's attitudes toward abolishing cash depend in part on their attitude toward victimless crimes. If they really believe that anything that the government decides is a crime should be stamped out entirely, then they're okay with eliminating cash. Whereas if you believe in civil liberties, you'd be a little more reluctant to eliminate the privacy features of cash. Central bank digital currency combined with the abolition of cash 
or viewed as a means to abolish cash, that's concerning for civil liberties reasons because transactions in central bank digital currency can all be traced in real time. Government knows what you're spending on and who's receiving it. Orwellian version of that, of course, is in China, where the Chinese Communist Party wants to be able to track all transactions. And they are introducing a central bank digital currency and squeezing out the private digital currencies, WeChat Pay and Alipay, forcing them to surveil their customers so that they can link it to their social credit system, where if you want to make all kinds of transactions, you need the government's permission. So if you're considered a dissident or somebody who's not a good citizen, you go to buy a train ticket with your credit card and you find out the transaction doesn't go through because... Your credit card is issued by a government-owned bank, and they can turn down the transaction if they don't like you or what you're using it for. And so that's a system in which people are very closely controlled, and we don't want that kind of system in a free country. And when I hear people say, oh, they're falling behind the Chinese in this technology, it's not a wonderful technology. It's a surveillance technology. I'm happy to fall behind them in surveillance technology. So let me try to give the other side of that argument because I've never been that persuaded by the privacy objection. I don't also agree with CBDC, but for different reasons. I've got other objections. <laughs> okay, for example, here in Europe, it's very easy to transact just via bank transfers. It's not so easy in the US. It's very easy here in Europe. Any bank to any bank, any time, any day. So if you want to go buy a chair out of someone's house, you just send a bank transfer very quickly. So no checks, nothing. But also, very few people willingly use cash. So to have the cash remaining for the tiny proportion of people that want to use it, it doesn't seem like a very good reason. And now, because of privacy, in the US, they knock off Alex Jones, for example, off of almost every payment platform. The PayPal does it, if anyone does it, the bank area account for almost sometimes no good reason. And Canada, infamously last year in Canada. So that privacy stuff, it seems that we already lack so much privacy that the idea of having a CBDC doesn't seem to intrude even further because it will be already lack so much of it. But also, if you want the privacy, you couldn't just use crypto. I'm against what happened in Canada, where the government stepped in and said, we're going to stop these protesters from receiving the money sent through the banking system or sent through crypto exchanges. So they actually stopped the crypto exchanges from processing the transfers. I don't want to preserve cash if nobody wants to use cash, but there should be ways of using digital currency that are private if people want those. And Venmo and other private digital currencies should be free to tell the government we're not going to censor people because you ask us to. Now, of course, it's a hassle for them to fight the government, and they're aware that the government can shut them down, and so they cooperate. But I would like to live in a world where people can conduct private transactions using electronic means. Although the issuer can surveil them, the issuer chooses not to and isn't forced to. Now, crypto, as you mentioned, doesn't have any central party. If I send you Bitcoin, it doesn't go through any bank or intermediary. It goes through some exchange, but the exchange might be decentralized. That is an important role that crypto plays of preserving privacy in transfers. But I think a central bank digital currency would be a big step in the U.S., especially if it's combined with eliminating Federal Reserve notes, which a lot of people do want to use in the United States more than in Europe. Although in, in some places in Europe, cash is more common than others. In Germany, it's pretty common. But there, in some European countries, there's a limit on cash transactions you can make. So in France, it's illegal. I think it's a thousand euros is the most you can spend in cash. In the US, if you buy something with cash for more than $10,000, it's legal, but the recipient has to report it. So travel agents and jewelers and other people who get big cash payments, real estate are supposed to report them. Although there's no sanction, it does wave a red flag that somebody might want to come investigate where you got that currency from if it's not obvious. But there have been some ridiculous cases where ordinary people have been hassled in their everyday transactions. One example, there's a, a couple who own a farm and they were selling their artisanal cheeses at farmer's markets where the transactions are in cash. And so they were depositing a few thousand dollars worth of cash every weekend. And the authorities seized their account on the grounds that these deposits add up to $10,000. So we think you're illegally 
structuring your deposits so that they don't exceed the $10,000 limit. And the authorities seized their account and the couple had to sue to get their money back, which tossed them a lot of time and effort. And fortunately, a nonprofit legal firm took on their case for them, so it didn't cost them out of pocket. But that sort of thing is ridiculous. That's the everyday concern I have about putting everything on networks where there's a backdoor for the government to surveil them. The thing about central bank digital currency, I, I want to say my other big objection is that in the form of everybody has an account on the books of the Federal Reserve System, which is the leading model, it means that the Fed is going to have to provide retail payment services. And the Fed has no expertise in retail payment services. They have no comparative advantage. They have no experience doing it. That would be a, a crazy idea. Sometimes when you push people on that, they say, okay, the banks would provide the actual retail payment services, but all the deposits they take are transferred to the Fed. Then the next objection is, then what do the banks do in order to get money to lend? If all their deposits are going to the Federal Reserve, how do they lend money? And the answer I get is, oh, the Fed will lend them back the money so that they can serve as intermediaries and make small business loans and so on. If that happens, I imagine that these borrowings that banks make from the Fed are going to come with strings attached. Anybody who has an agenda for the banks to pursue for them, don't lend money to fossil fuel companies, don't lend money to tobacco companies, don't lend money to gun dealers, don't lend money to, we already have pot dealers excluded from the banking system. That will become a political battlefield. I don't want the government further involved in deciding the allocation of credit. Yeah, that's my main objection also to a lot of these CBDC things in the U.S. Although you have this odd play where people would say, well, even if in the U.S. you shouldn't have CBDC, but in smaller countries, less developed countries, maybe you should have a CBDC. They always made that move. So in my view, there's even less reason in smaller countries to have CBDC than the U.S. And <laughs> if people don't, don't tend to realize that. There's an international consortium sponsored by the UN called the Better Than Cash Alliance. And if you look into who's involved in this, it's just a group of rent seekers. It's governments who want digital payments so that they can collect taxes more effectively. And it's Visa and MasterCard who want to get a piece of the digital payment system through either their credit card system or their debit card systems. It's not clear to me at all that this is driven by consumers who want a different payment system. So in the Caribbean, there are active CBDC projects already public. Jamaica has one, Eastern Caribbean has one, and Bahamas has one actively. No one uses them. I think maybe in the Eastern Caribbean, less than maybe $50,000 is in the entire circulation in that system. So it's very similar to what happened in Ecuador, because these are all claims to U.S. dollars, ultimately. And why would you want to hold a government-issued claim to U.S. dollars when you can hold U.S. dollars? Precisely. That's exactly what I usually say as well. Dr. White, what are you working on now? Ah, I just finished the first draft of a paper on the history of classical liberal views on banking and finance for a handbook of classical liberalism. And I'm working on a paper on whether the Federal Reserve should raise its inflation target. Short answer, no. <laughs> but there are a number of economists who think that having a higher inflation target would give the Fed more leeway to cut interest rates because we have permanently higher interest rates if we have permanently higher inflation. And I think it's pretty clear it's not worth it. Thank you so much, Dr. White. This has been a very fun conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed it. That's it for this episode. For updates about the podcast, please subscribe to our Substack blog found on cpfi.media. You can also read our newsletters and long-form content on Caribbean policy improvements. 